Hey, everybody. Good morning. Still got people coming in. Excited to have you here with us. Um, whether you're here in person or online, it's good to have you. We're going to just spend some time in worship like we usually do on Sunday morning. And I just encourage you to find a place, find a way <clears throat> to kind of push out all the busyness, the craziness of your day, and just focus on the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's worship him. Communion is a part of that. There's a communion tray over here. There is one also in the back where you can just get one of the little all-in-one cups. You can have a moment at the altar or back at your seat. Or you can come over here, break off a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, and just have a time to remember. Scripture says to remember what Jesus did. That he came, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, three days later rose from the dead, and now he sits at the right hand of the Father, says, interceding for us. It's an amazing thing to know that we have a living Savior who is ready, will, willing, and wanting to come back for his church. We remember that. When we take communion, Scripture says we identify as a follower of Christ. I'm a follower of Jesus. I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior. If you've done that, communion is for you. And it's a great time to just be still and let God speak to you. Hear his voice. Lord, I just thank you that th this communion, the Lord's Supper, what we do, Lord, that you set this up. You said do it often. Remember, we identify and we listen to, to you. We pray that you would bless the bread, your body, the cup, your blood shed for us. And Lord, in all of this, help us draw us into worship this morning, that we might hear you, that you might speak to us, and that we might show how much we love you as we worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Let's just worship for a while.
breath within my body and I have life with inside my bones thank you Lord and I cannot help but praise you God you've been good to me amen you've been good so good to us, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Just 
streets get rough, I will still sing out your praise, your praise, because I need you, yes, Lord.
Jesus, you are Lord. Yes, Lord Jesus, we love you. Lord, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for how much you love us. Guys, that song is so important. <clears throat> we need to know what God says about us because some days things happen. Sorrow, trouble, uh, things don't go the way we plan. People make us feel a certain way or less than. And, and we can wonder, God, do you really care? God, do you love? God, do you know what's going on? And he says, you are loved. He says, you are chosen before the foundations of the world. He knew you, and he loved you. While we were still sinners, Scripture says that God sent Jesus to die for us, for you, <clears throat> because you're valuable. You are precious. You're loved. Sometimes we sing a song, Lord, I believe, and yet things get in the way and we, we really don't. So, Father, I just pray for, for me. I pray for us, Lord, that we would know what 
you say about us, who we are in you. And Lord, no matter what goes on around us, and I know things can happen and we can, in a moment, find ourselves down or hard on ourselves, but Lord, let us know who you say we are. Let us know whose we are. And in that, Lord, let us live, let us strive, let us work to be, to become the person you created us to be. Lord, we don't earn our salvation. Lord, that's a gift, and I thank you for that. But Lord, the journey we take, that next step, there is a cost to that. There is a cost to following you. Help us hear your voice clearer than all the other voices. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, before you're seated or after you're seated, find somebody, greet them, let them know it's good to have them here today. And we're going to have an amazing day. Thanks, guys. Before we go any further, uh, it sounds like we're having a little bit of an issue with our cameras and YouTube, and uh, they're working on that, so you guys don't have any problem with any of that, but if you're watching online, you might see some, uh, some jerkiness, some, uh, looks like I'm uh, in a strobe light, maybe, uh, hopefully that won't bother you too much, and uh, uh, ushers, come on up. We're going to receive this morning's tithes and offering. Lord, we just, we thank you. We thank you that you're a God that you call us by name. You know us. We were created in your image. Lord, that's amazing that we have your fingerprint, your DNA kind of in us and on us. And Lord, your characteristic is you're generous. And Lord, I pray that you would grow that generosity, not only in our finances, but in how we use and spend our time and our energy and our gifts and our talents. But Lord, I pray that we would hear your guidance, your direction, your leading. And in this moment, as we give back to you what you've entrusted us in finances, Lord, I pray that you would bless the giver, the gift. You would bless what we do uh, with each gift that comes in. Give us wisdom, give us direction, and help us do the most we can with what we've been entrusted. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Guys, we have, uh, last Wednesday, we were wondering if we were going to have Wednesday night. We were going to have a Wednesday night, but whether we were going to gather for Wednesday night. Um, last week, they were saying we could be getting 18-ish inches of snow doesn't look like that's going to happen. So as of now, Wednesday is on, the meal is on, 5.30 to 6.30 we'll be serving a meal, 6.30 to 7.30 we will be in our groups, and that's for every age stage. There's something for kids, teens, and adults. And uh, so just I hope that you can be here. Next week is Easter. Can you believe it? I, I, I get going on the year, and you just go, January's gone, February, March, we're in April. Uh, unbelievable, uh, but we are going to be together next week. Hope that you're here. Just want to encourage you, if, if there's people in your life you're just going like, you know, they've said something about maybe being interested in church. Easter is one of those weeks that people who might not normally go might be going like, hey, I think I, I would be willing to do that. This might be a great time to just go, hey, friend, why don't you come with me? Let's go. We're going to hear about Jesus and what he has done for each and every one of us. We've been on a, a journey, a trip, kind of to the cross, and, 
uh, calling it 30 piece, pieces of silver, not everything has to do with, with uh, Judas and what he did with those 30 pieces, but there are always things that kind of get in the way of our following. And uh, we're one week away, like I said, from Easter. Um, and, and just thinking about this, I am, I'm so glad that we have, and, and kind of talking in, in, in Bible words or Christianese, uh, a high priest. We have Jesus, that scripture says he was tempted in every way like we're tempted. Uh, it would be really not fair almost to have a, a savior who lived an insulated life and wasn't tempted. And you think about the temptations that you have or that you struggle with, scripture says that Jesus was tempted Maybe not with the exact, you know, apples to apples, but it was the same temptation. It was the same root cause that he was tempted. And it says he did it, but he didn't sin, which, man, it just blows me away. And, and I have to really put myself in this position. He didn't respond the way that I do sometimes. He didn't respond to those temptations the way that you do Sometimes that we give in and we find ourselves making bad choices. As we look at coming up to the cross, uh, I, I don't know if you've noticed this, but maybe this year more than ever it jumped out at me. As I got closer to the, the, the cross, it seems like there was a lot of, of red in my Bible, a lot of Jesus' words. And, and I've got to think that, you know, Jesus knew his time was coming close. Jesus knew that the end was right there, right before him. And I think if you and I knew that we only had a small chunk of time, I think the words that we've said to our friends and our family would be meaningful. We would find ourselves saying, I want to make sure you get this, Dustin. I want to make sure you understand what I'm talking about. And Jesus really was about that. Not that the first part of his ministry wasn't important, but I think he was restating stuff. He was saying, this is important because I don't want you to miss this. This is important not only for his disciples, but as we read it today, it's important for us to understand what Jesus was saying and what he was about. Today, we're going to spend most of our time, if you have your Bibles or your you, you, you version on your device, you can go to that, and, and we're going to be start with Matthew 28, 36 through 46, kind of a big chunk, but this is, this is right as Jesus was, uh, right before he was arrested, right before he was taken to trial, right before all of the cruelty that happened to him was happening, and it says in verse 36, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and I pray. He took Peter and the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Something was happening. He knew something was about him. He became sorrowful and became troubled. When he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going just a little further with his face to the ground, he prayed. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples, and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went a second time to pray, my father, if it is possible... If it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, 
he found them asleep again because their eyes were heavy. So he left them, and he went away, and he, he prayed a third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Father, I pray that we're not going to cover all the angles of this verse, of these verses. But Lord, I pray that the few that we do look at, they would come alive to us. And something in each of the parts, Lord, something would speak to each person here today. That everyone would walk away with something that would impact them. And Lord, you would just continue. You said that you're faithful to finish what you've started and Lord, I pray that there would be something said today that would get us a little closer to that finished product that you're working on. In Jesus' name, amen. I find myself <clears throat> each year at this time, and other times of the year, but especially this time of the year, drawn to this passage. This is, this is one of those that, you know, there's Christmas passages that we read, and and there's, there's Easter, and this is one that just speaks to me. And I can say that there has always been, and this year is no exception, something that seems to jump out that has never jumped out before. I find that hard to believe. I'm 60 years old. I can't tell you how many times I've read this or spoke on this. And yet, every time something comes out, and it's just, I, just a side note, Guys, it is so important to re 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 read scripture and to re 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 read scripture like you've never read it before. Because it's easy to, to read something that you're really familiar with and just go, oh, yeah, I know that. And we jump over a part and then we land on something we read a little bit. Oh, yeah, I know that part too. Man, read it like you've never read it before. And say, God, speak to me. I'm listening. I want to hear. I want to see something fresh, something that jumped out in, in this life, we will have sorrow and trouble. You know what? There's a lot of gospel out there that says, follow Jesus and everything's going to be amazing. Jesus never said that. Jesus never modeled that for us. Jesus never had that as his experience with life. And he's God in flesh living a perfect life, living a sinless life. And yet here we see, in other places we see that he was tempted, he struggled, he, 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 he was tired, he was hungry, he was thirsty. He, he experienced all that we did. There was sorrow and there was trouble. John 16, says, I have told you these things that in me you may have peace. He wants us to have peace. But in this world, you will have trouble. Things will come up. But still, peace. Relax. Uh, the last two years, whatever we've been through, whatever you've been through, I'm not here doom and gloom, but we're probably going to have something new in a year or two. Sorry. But what we do with what happens, I can still have peace. I can still know that God's in control. I can still know that God didn't wake up one morning and go, what, Corona? Never saw that one coming. What? Boop. Never saw that one coming. What? Who got elected? No, he, he sees it. He knows it. He knew, just like he knew you before the foundation, he knows. And he's not thrown off. So I can go, peace. My God's in control. All I have to do is be a follower, a faithful follower, a faithful believer, one who knows Scripture. We're studying on Wednesday, Revelation. It's good to know what's around the corner. And it's good to know that when it's coming, our God is in control. And over 2,000 years ago, 3,000, 4,000, people were talking prophetically about what. You talk about living in Bible times, guys. We're living in Bible times. We're living in some of the best Bible times. And we should have peace and we should be excited about it. But troubles will happen. But take heart, Jesus is saying, I've overcome the world. 
was on the cross and he said, it is finished. That doesn't mean our sorrow and trouble is done. It means he conquered death, the grave, and we can have peace in anything. The psalmist said it this way in Psalms 119, 28, my soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. We need to be in God's word. We need to stand and sit and rest in his word and know that that will bring peace and strength to each one of us. Stuff happens. It's going to continue to happen. But we need to know that our God is in control. And we have a high priest who in this moment found himself in a moment of suffering and and in torment. And he, he finds himself. And when he finds himself in this condition... It's important to realize what he does. He doesn't crawl into a corner and crawl into a ball and just start shaking and doesn't know what to do. But it says when he does this, he prays. When struggles come, when torment comes, when things that we don't know what's going on. I I need to be a person who doesn't just call up everybody and go, man, woe is me, the sky is falling. Jesus said, Scripture says he went and prayed. We need to be people when things happen in our lives, find ourselves in prayer. I think it's interesting. This is kind of the bookend. This isn't the end, but this is kind of the beginning of the end of his ministry, his public ministry. Um, This is kind of the last time he was really with his disciples, so it ends. And yet, when we read Scripture, we see that Jesus started his ministry in a moment of prayer. In prayer and fasting, Matthew 4, 1 through 3. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. This kind of started his public ministry. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came, and you know the rest of the story. But he just didn't fast. He just did not eat. There was prayer and fasting going on. He was connected with the Father. He was setting himself up for the launch of his ministry. And then we see in what we read today in Matthew 28, 36 through 34, that he ends his public ministry in the same way he started it, in prayer. He started alone, and then he ends it with his disciples and speaking life into them, and he's praying. And we see Jesus went with his disciples to Gethsemane, and he prayed says, sit here, took some of them with him, and he went on a little further. Today, the first thing that I really want to look at is some of the parallels. Jesus, in starting his ministry, one of the, <clears throat> after the, the fasting and the prayer, we, there's a huge chunk in Matthew 6, 7, and 8, I think is where that's found, the Sermon on the Mount. And he just kind of downloads so much stuff. And it's not just... Oh, I said that now. It's never going to be mentioned again. But we see a lot of what Jesus talked about reiterated, restated, brought into, weaved in to different things. And here we find one of those times, the the, the parallel between there's a lot about the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Matthew 6, 9 through 13. He said, pray this way, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And in this last little chunk, we see that Jesus, when he was with his disciples, he said, sit here, I'm going to go pray And he starts off his prayer with, my father. Some of your Bibles might say, Abba, Father. But it's holy. It's that reverent. It's like he starts off that prayer. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Jesus is modeling in his sorrow and in his trouble the Lord's prayer. He's not saying it verbatim. There's nothing wrong with saying the Lord's prayer verbatim. But if I can say the Lord's Prayer and be thinking about other things, am I really praying to God? Does that make sense? 
So there's nothing wrong with it. But I think what he's doing here is going like, hey, you don't need to say the whole thing, but there's key parts of this for different things that are going on in your life to just help you, to help you allow peace to come in when there's trouble, when there's turmoil in your life. And he's saying, our Father, my Father, If it is possible for this cup to be taken from me, yet not my will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus is re-praying. He's going like, guys, that prayer wasn't just important on the Sermon on the Mount. It's life, and it's something that should be a part of your day-to-day and everything about you every day. There's something going to cause you to find yourself on your face before God and say, oh, my father, that that might not be the way you pray. But however you engage with the holy of holies, the God of the universe, my father, dear Jesus, Lord Jesus, God, I come to you and I pray, let's just get this in our hearts. Jesus is praying. He says, my father, not my will, but yours be done. He's not really saying the prayer, but it's still in his life. When he gets to this this other part, he goes back and he's talking to Peter. Watch, so that you do not fall into temptation. It's a spoken to Paul. Peter, sorry, Paul doesn't come for a while yet. Peter, but he's saying, hey, don't fall into temptation. And he's praying a prayer over a friend really in that moment. And lead me not into temptation. Peter, stay up, stay alert. Don't let temptation take you away into a new spot. He's praying the prayer and he's saying it. It's just cool to see that Jesus is, is teaching us to pray He's modeling it in some of the last moments of his time with his disciples. I I just thought it was interesting. At at the end, it says, but deliver us from the evil one. It it took me back to Matthew 16, uh, 22 and 23. We looked at that a couple weeks ago when when Peter is, is hearing what Jesus is talking about the cross. And Peter's going like, never That will never happen to you. We will never allow that to happen. We won't allow you to give your life for the sins of the world, is what he was really saying. It wasn't what he was meaning. He was going like, we would never let somebody come and do that to you. And Jesus looks, and he was saying, I I, I need deliverance from the evil one. And some of those evil ones in my life and in your life might be friends that are saying things for the right reasons, but the wrong things they're saying. Peter was saying, I love you. I I would never want that to happen to you. But he was saying, I would never let you do, fulfill why you came to this planet in the first place. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. Deliver me from the evil one. Deliver me from even my disciples that are saying things that are contrary to why I am here. Trouble, suffering happens. In those moments, let's take that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples and taught us to pray and let it just become a part of our day. Let us see different moments. I hope I see different moments. I just take that prayer and, again, don't say it verbatim, but say it in a way that says, God, yeah. I I need you, not my will, but yours be done. Deliver me from evil. Don't let me go down those paths. Your will, not my will. Lord, I want to be where you want me to be. A final thought on this whole passage. Jesus, in his prayer, one of the, the things that he just he keeps coming back to is my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. You, you know, there's, there's people who have talked about Jesus praying and, and, and sweating uh, blood. It says when we're in that much sorrow and torment, people have said that capillaries, I think, can burst and, and it can look like blood is actually sweating 
from someone when they're in that kind of condition? And why did Jesus find himself at that moment in so much turmoil and so much to the, to the point of death to pray, my father, if it is possible, okay, if it's possible, if there's another plan, if there's another thing that can happen besides what's happening in the next couple of days, may this cup be taken from me. And he says, yet not my will, but as you will. And then he comes back the second time, and he prays almost the same prayer. But he says, my father, if it's not possible. And something in him just changed already. If it's possible, if it's not possible. He already knows. God's speaking to him and said, son, this is, this is it. This is the plan. This is what has to happen. If it can't be taken unless I drink it, may your will be done. I want to spend the rest of our time just thinking about this. Why? Why is Jesus so overwhelmed in this moment? And, and I know there's things firing in all of your minds. You, you, maybe you've seen the, 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 a, a movie about the crucifixion or you've seen something and you're going like, I got some ideas why he doesn't want to go down this road. But he, he's overwhelmed. Why is he filled with sorrow to the point of death? These are great questions. These are great things for us to find ourselves on our face before God and praying and wrestling through. Why is his will and the Father's will seemingly different at this point? Because he's praying, God, this isn't my will anymore. At some level, he's saying, I, I really don't want to go through with this. And I love this because he was tempted in every way like you and I were tempted. So when there's something that's not pleasant, when there's something we, that, that we know God's calling us to do, but it's not going to be pleasant, there can be something inside of us that go, I don't know if I really want to do that. I don't know if I want to love that person. I don't know if I want to love quite like that. I don't know if I want to be quite that generous. I, I don't know if I want to be quite that forgiving. Whatever it is in our life, we can have a moment that we go, God, I really don't want to do this. But hopefully we're like Jesus and we say, but not my will, God. I want your will to be clear. I want to know this is you. And if it is you, I'm all in. And then Jesus goes, if, if it has to be this way, then not my will, but yours be done. Why is his will and the Father's will, it seems like they're at different points. They're at different things. Jesus has a different will at this time, but he's saying, I'll submit to your will, Father, whatever it is. Is it because of the death on the cross? He had seen people die on the cross. Anybody in this area had seen it. It was very public. It was, it was a deterrent. It was, you don't want this to happen to you, so don't do A, B, C, or D. And if you do, this is what you can expect. So they all knew what it looked like. And they had an idea of watching the faces of the people on the cross to know, oh, I think I got an idea what that feels like, too. Not so good. Was it... See, if, if God knows you, and he knew you before, and he knows your days, and he knows all about you, Jesus knew what was coming for him as he was in the garden praying, and he, he was in torment and sorrow to the point of death. Was it that he, he didn't want his beard? I don't know. This could be not a lot of beards out there, but could you imagine somebody grabbing a big chunk of your beard and just ripping it out? Do you ever watch those videos of the, the guys getting uh, waxed? You know, could you imagine him just putting that on there and then Was that what he, he I really don't want the, the waxing. I, I don't want that. Was it the whipping? They had seen people whipped and Jesus going like, man, I just don't. And my whipping is even beyond anybody else's. It's taken to the end. Was that what was stopping him? Him being beat. Him
him being spit on. Was, was that it? He'd go like, man, that, that humiliation, the, what that does to, I, I don't want to go through with that. I, I would think that all of those things and everything else that happened to Jesus in those moments was a part of why he was at odds with his father, why his will and the father's will, because his humanity would go like, that's going to hurt. I, I, I just as soon not do that. But I don't think that was the major point of his torment, of his sorrow, of his at odds with the Father, what it seems like. More than any of that, I think it's the fact that Jesus realized that was what was coming, not the whipping, not the beard tearing out, not being spit on, not even being nailed to the cross. But he realized that what was right around the corner was for the first time in forever. And we have a hard time thinking of forever. I, I can think of 60 years, and I, I can go, oh, I can imagine that. I can imagine 100. I can imagine 40 more. I, I, there's stuff, but Forever. You just, in your mind, think no beginning. Let your mind go back that far. And when you think you're just about there, you just started. There, there's way more. All this time, Jesus and the Father have been connected. They've never been separated in forever. They've never been apart. Scripture says things like this. John 10, 30, I and the Father am one. We're, we're one. He's saying we've never been apart. We've always been one. We always will be one. Uh, he said, I am the vine and you are the branch. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You go, why was Jesus able to do so much? Why did everybody he prayed for? Because he was perfect in who he chose to pray for, who he was led to pray for, because him and the Father were connected. They were like that branch in the vine, totally, the full picture of that. They did everything together. John 5, 19, very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He's saying, I don't do this by myself. I'm connected to the Father. I see the Father. I hear the Father constantly. He can only do what he sees the Father doing because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. When Jesus was on the cross... And I believe he saw this when he was in the garden. He knew it the whole time. But when it's right at his doorstep, he sees himself at the cross and he sees the sins of the world being placed on him. Your sins and my sins being laid on him as he's this perfect sacrifice. At that moment, for the first time in forever, him and the Father are separated. It says the Father turned and looked away. I don't think we get it. Because unfortunately, I think I, we, you spend a lot of our lives disconnected from the Father. We know what it feels like. It's, it's those moments that we're connected that you, you, maybe you get goosebumps, maybe you cry, maybe you shake, maybe you do, but you just go, wow, did you feel the presence of God? Have you ever had that moment where you go, that was God? That's amazing. That's how Jesus lived all the time, fully connected. And he was going like, God, I like being connected to you. I like the fact that forever and ever and ever, we've always been together. We've been one. I don't do anything apart from the Father. If you see me doing it, it's because the Father told me to do it. I've heard the Father. I do it. I'm obedient. That's it. I don't want to be disconnected. Whew. He he didn't want that so much that it caused sorrow and it caused torment and it caused almost the feeling of death. Have you ever had those heaviness that you just go, man, I think it would be better to die than have this feeling any longer. That was Jesus 
in the garden. He was that perfect sacrifice. Jesus was that spotless lamb that takes away the sins of the world. At that moment, God turned away. When Jesus was on the cross in Mark 15, 34, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God didn't forsake him. God just couldn't look at his perfect son in that condition, and he turned. And at that moment, there was a separation. This is what I really do believe Jesus truly dreaded, what he didn't want to happen. It says that Jesus came to this world. One of the reasons he came was to take away our sins, but was also to let us see who God was and what a relationship of being connected to God, reconnected to God, could and should and have the potential of looking like. So we have this, the, the, the Savior who came to show us how to live. He came to show us how to live fully connected to God. It wasn't that he was God and they were always connected. Because when he came here, it said that he was fully God, fully man. Again, we don't get that. But he was fully man. He set aside his deity. So he could have lived disconnected, but he didn't. And he showed us that it's possible to live connected to the Father. And he showed us what that connected life could and should and would look like. It's possible for us to live fully connected to the Father. To inspire, to encourage, to challenge us to live maybe we can't get our head around fully connected to challenge encourage inspire us to live more connected than we're living right now he wants you and i to live this next week more connected to god to him than we did the week before and to keep growing in that not just on sunday we have people that come in and go like man i'm so glad sunday's here I feel like I'm dragging. It was just a tough week. Man, we, we don't have to come to church like it's a gas station and get filled up. I, I'm glad that happens. I'm glad that in worship we go like, man, something happened in worship when we're together. Yeah, that's amazing. But it should happen that way because we all bring our worship together, and when we're together, it just overflows. We talk about that, Paul and Silas in the jail. As they worship, people who were in chains next to them, their chains were broken. They were set free. They were delivered. And yeah, so something should happen when we're together. Not just in the morning. You know, like, Joel, I'm not just a Sunday. I, I have devotions every morning. God's looking for more than just every morning with you. So that, you know, I, I do it in the evening, too. A lot of time between morning and evening. God wants us to learn how to stay and be fully connected. I, I pray every time I get in trouble. <laughs> and I get in trouble a lot. You know, maybe that's you. God wants us to pray more than when we're speeding and see a cop. He wants us to get more than when we get caught doing something amok. Not just in trouble. It's good to pray when we're in trouble. We talked about that. When sorrow and trouble come, what did Jesus do? He, prayed so be that person to pray that that might be something that that gets your attention more than in special moments being connected easter christmas be fully always connected i don't know what that looks like I, i'm your pastor i'm saying like i i really don't think i live fully connected I live more connected than I used to. That's good. But there's still a lot of room to go, God, I, I, I don't want my mind to wander away from you. We're created kind of that way. We're in his image, but we're also in a sinful nature. And we have this, uh, let, me, let me do it by myself, Western mentality that we're fighting with. 
But God says, no, let me partner with you in all that you do. Lord, I just pray that in all of this, we again, we would walk away with something. Maybe you're here today and you go, Joel, I, I realize there are things that come up in my life and, and, and I try to fix them or avoid them. And, and I realize that in this, I need to bring God into those troubled, sorrow-filled moments and not just try to grin and bear it and grit and bear it and just get through it. But I need, I need to invite God into those tough times in my life. If that's you, I, I, eyes are closed and you're respecting people around you. If that's you, just raise your hand. I want to pray with you before we're done today. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Maybe that's God saying, yeah, thank you. Hey, I'm here. What are you going to do, do on your own or... You're going to invite me into this moment, and we can be more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens you. Maybe you've, you've seen that Lord's Prayer in a new way, and it's not just to be quoted, although it can be, but it might be to take those, those key parts of that verse and implement it into your prayer life and implement it into your life and, and go like, ooh. I need to pray that I wouldn't be led into temptation before I get there. I, I pray, that God, you would deliver me. Show me a way out. Lord, that I would pray that my will and your will, although they're contrary, they're, they're not the same. I want to surrender to yours and get mine out of the way. I must decrease. You, you need to increase in my life. If that's you, wave at me right now. I just want to pray with you too. Thanks all over. Yeah, yeah. And maybe you're here and going like, Joel, I honestly, I live, and I realize more than ever that I live disconnected. I'm curious of what a connected life would look like. I'm curious what God would have for me if I would stay fully connected to him. If you're going like, Joel, I, I want to this next week just try to Maybe set my alarm, set a clock, set something to say, oh, yeah, Lord, I, I want to invite you into this moment, into, into this time period of my life. If that's you, one more time, just wave at me. I just want to pray with people today. Yep, yep. Lord, that's me. I want to stay. I want to live more connected. Lord, I pray that you would, you, you would not let us get overwhelmed in trouble and sorrow and and, and try to do it on our own, but we would invite you, that would be a cue to us to stay connected to you, that we would weave not only the Lord's Prayer, but other prayers that we see in Scripture, and teach us how to pray, and pray correctly, and pray rightly, and, and pray that we would hear what you're saying to us. Lord, that we would we would figure out, we would learn from you how to stay connected. As we see your life, as we read it, we go like, wow, that happened because he was fully connected. Because him and the Father were one. Lord, how do I become more like Jesus in that way? How do I become connected to the Father more than ever before? Lord, this week as we come up into Easter, Lord, may that be a prayer of our heart to live this week more connected than ever before. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys and have an amazing week. Can't wait to see you on Easter Sunday and Wednesday if you're able. God bless you.